said all you're going to say about time? I've said all you need to know. There is no time. All things exist simultaneously. All events occur at once. This book is being written, and as it's being written, it's already written. It already exists. In fact, that's where you're getting all this information, from the book that already exists. You're merely bringing it into form. This is what is meant by, even before you ask, I will have answered. This information about time all seems, well, all interesting, but rather esoteric. Does it have any application to real life? A true understanding of time allows you to live much more peacefully within your reality of relativity, where time is experienced as a movement, a flow, rather than a constant. It is you who are moving, not time. Time has no movement. There's only one moment. At some level, you deeply understand this. That is why when something really magnificent or significant occurs in your life, you often say it is as if time stands still. It does. And when you do also, you often experience one of those life-defining moments. Whew, I find this hard to believe. How can this be possible? Your science has already proven this mathematically. Formulas have been written showing that if you get into a spaceship and fly far enough, fast enough, you could swing back around toward the Earth and watch yourself taking off. This demonstrates that time is not a movement, but a field through which you move, in this case, on Spaceship Earth. You say it takes 365 days to make a year, but what is a day? You've decided, quite arbitrarily, I might add, that a day is the time it takes your spaceship to make one complete revolution on its axis. How do you know that it's made such a spin? You can't feel it moving. You've chosen a reference point in the heavens, the sun. You say it takes a full day for the portion of the spaceship you are on to face the sun, turn away from the sun, then face the sun again. You've divided this day into 24 hours. Again, quite arbitrarily. You could just as easily have said 10 or 73. Then you divided each hour into minutes. You said each hourly unit contains 60 smaller units called minutes, and that each of those contains 60 tiny units called seconds. One day you noticed that the Earth was not only spinning, it was also flying. You saw that it was moving through space around the sun. You carefully calculated that it took 365 revolutions of the Earth for the Earth itself to revolve around the sun. This number of Earth spins you called a year. Things got kind of messy when you decided that you wanted to divide up a year into units smaller than a year but larger than a day. You created the week and the month and you managed to get the same number of months in every year, but not the same number of days in every month. You couldn't find a way to divide an odd number of days, 365, by an even number of months, 12. So you just decided that some months contain more days than others. You felt you had to stay with 12 as the yearly subdivider because that was the number of lunar cycles you observed your moon moving through during the year. In order to reconcile these three spatial events, revolutions around the sun, spins of the earth on its axis, and moon cycles, you simply adjusted the number of days in each month. Even this device didn't solve all the problems because your earlier inventions kept creating a build-up of time, which you didn't know what to do with. So you also decided that every so often one year would have to have a whole day more. You called this leap year and joked about it, but you actually live by such a construction. And then you call my explanation of time unbelievable. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've just as arbitrarily created decades and centuries, based interestingly on tens, not twelves, to further measure the passage of time. But all along, what you've really been doing is merely devising a way to measure movements through space. Thus we see that it is not time which passes, but objects which pass through. 
and move around in a static field which you call space. Time is simply your way of counting movements. Scientists deeply understand this connection, therefore speak in terms of the space-time continuum. Dr. Einstein and others realized that time was a mental construction, a relational concept. Time was what it was relative to the space that existed between objects. If the universe is expanding, which it is, then it takes longer for the Earth to revolve around the sun today than it did a billion years ago. There's more space to cover. Thus it took more minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, and centuries for all these cyclical events to occur recently than it did in 1492. When is a day not a day? When is a year not a year? Your new, highly sophisticated timing instruments now record this time discrepancy, and every year clocks around the world are adjusted to accommodate a universe that won't sit still. This is called Greenwich Mean Time, and it is mean because it makes a liar out of the universe. Einstein theorized that it wasn't time which was moving, but he, who was moving through space at a given rate, all he had to do was change the amount of space between objects or change the rate of speed with which he moved through space from one object to another to alter time. It was his general theory of relativity which expanded your modern-day understanding of the correlation between time and space. You now maybe can understand why. If you make a long journey through space and return, you may have aged only ten years, while your friends on Earth will have aged thirty. The farther you go, the more you will warp the space-time continuum, and the less your chances when you land of finding alive on the Earth anyone who was there when you left. However, if scientists on Earth in some future time developed a way to propel themselves faster, they could cheat the universe and stay in sync with real time on Earth, returning to find at the same time had passed on Earth as had passed on the spaceship. Obviously, if even more propulsion were available, one could return to the Earth before one took off. That is to say, time on Earth would pass more slowly than time on the spaceship. You could come back in ten of your years, and the Earth would have aged only four. Increase the speed, and ten years in space might mean ten minutes on Earth. Now, come across a fold in the fabric of space. Einstein and others believed such folds exist, and they were correct. And you are suddenly propelled across space in one infinitesimal moment. Could such a time-space phenomenon literally fling you back into time? It should not be quite as difficult to now see that time does not exist except as a construction of your mentality. Everything that's ever happened and is ever going to happen is happening now. The ability to observe it merely depends on your point of view, your place in space. If you were in my place, you could see it all right now. Comprehend? Wow. I'm beginning to, uh, on a theoretical level. Yes. Good. I've explained it to you here very simply so that a child could understand it. It may not make good science, but it produces good comprehension. Right now, physical objects are limited in terms of their speed, but, but non-physical objects, my thoughts, my, my soul, could theoretically move through the ether at incredible speeds. Exactly. Precisely. And that is what happens often in dreams and other out-of-body and psychic experiences. You now understand déjà vu. You probably have been there before. But, but, but if everything has already happened then it follows that I'm powerless to change my future. Is this predestination? No, don't buy into that. That is not true. In fact, this setup should serve you, not disserve you. You are always at a place of free will and total choice. 
Being able to see into the future or get others to do it for you should enhance your ability to live the life you want, not limit it. How? I need help here. If you see a future event or experience you do not like, don't choose it. Choose again. Select another. Change or alter your behavior so as to avoid the undesired outcome. But how can I avoid that which has already happened? It has not happened to you. Yet, you are at a place in the space-time continuum where you are not consciously aware of the occurrence. You do not know it has happened. You have not remembered your future. This forgetfulness is the secret of all time. It is what makes it possible for you to play the great game of life. I'll explain later. What you do not know is not so. Since you do not remember your future, it has not happened to you yet. A thing happens only when it is experienced. A thing is experienced only when it is known. Now, let's say you've been blessed with a brief glimpse, a split second, knowing of your future. What's happened is that your spirit, the non-physical part of you, has simply sped to another place on the space-time continuum and brought back some residual energy, some images or impressions of that moment or event. These you can feel, or sometimes another who has developed a metaphysical gift can feel or see these images and energies of this swirling about you. Oh. 